when I was in my 20s, I had a job for a while as a fry cook at Applebee's. And that job fucking sucked. But the boss was pretty cool. I worked a morning shift. And if we got all our prep work done before the restaurant opened, he would look the other way. If the kitchen crew went out back and smoked a couple of joints before the lunch rush started. He was also pretty cool about not noticing it if we maybe, you know, took a meal home at the end of our shifts once in a while. But then this dude named Jack started working there and he fucked it up for everybody. Right. He, he would like make it look like his prep work was done and then spend an hour outside smoking blunts. He'd take home a lunch that consisted of 27 chicken strips and four orders of fries. And we kept telling him he was going to ruin this shit for all of us, but the asshole wouldn't listen. And pretty soon we had to cook tequila lime chicken sober all damn afternoon. And I only mention this because having been privy to those failed interventions with Jack, I recognize and appreciate the tone of a recent warning from Ministry Watch about the disturbing trend of evangelical charity organizations pretending to be churches for the purposes of taxation. Underneath its thin veil of solicitude and moral apprehension are the unmistakable tones of don't fuck this up for the rest of us. So the piece I'm talking about here is an op-ed by Warren Cole Smith, the head of Ministry Watch, titled When a Church is Not a Church. And basically, it highlights the increasing number of institutions that were nonprofits for the purposes of taxation a few years ago and suddenly became churches under Trump's watch. The main difference between those two designations, of course, is the annual Form 990. It's basically a tax return for a nonprofit organization that's publicly available. It forces nonprofits to declare their income and their expenses, including a breakdown of their administrative fees and their salaries. It's the main document that groups like Charity Watch use to determine which charities rank where. But if you're designated as a church rather than a nonprofit, you don't have to file that shit or anything like it. And now, there are other differences, of course. There are additional tax breaks for churches, and technically there are greater restrictions on what you can and can't advocate, but nobody's been enforcing those regulations for years. But the main reason to change one's designation is to avoid telling the people who are giving you the money how much of it you spent on your wife's Lamborghini. Now, there actually are distinctions that exist in the tax code between church and not church, and and many of them are pretty meaningful. Like, for example, You know, you have to have a physical location that holds worship services that are open to the public on a regular basis. But that's pretty easy to get around, right? Somewhere in the middle of a massive multi-million dollar charity, you you have to have one single building where they do a worship service once a week. No problem. And that's why a group like Focus on the Family can suddenly wake up one day a couple of years ago and realize that they've been a church, not a nonprofit this whole time. And darn it, if they hadn't been filing their taxes wrong. You know, and, and if you want to be charitable and give Ministry Watch the benefit of the doubt, you can commend this piece for bringing this problem to the fore in such a way that it would end up getting discussed in the New York Times and the Washington Post. But if you're less lenient in your interpretation, you might notice the way it tries to hijack the conversation. Right. Like, sure, it points out the problem, but this is a problem that's been pointed out before. It also arms the offenders with plenty of bullshit, plausible deniability. For example, it tries to heap a little blame on secular groups who have publicized the charitable donations of prominent people to their own detriment, right? Like, uh, uh, th- think about the dude that founded Mozilla and then got pushed out when his donations to, to Proposition 8 came to light. And, and in Smith's view, that's a, quote, despicable practice engaged in by unscrupulous bullies, end quote. You know, because how dare people publicly associate you with yourself? And, and, and citing this excuse, he points out that many of these groups are probably changing their designation so that they can, you know, keep their bigotry funded privately. You know, so it's our fault. And, and as bad as that excuse is, it's not even fucking true. The IRS has already been over backwards to make sure bigot groups can keep their donors' names private. He, he also needs to justify the continued ability of churches to hide their own finances one way or the other. And here's the best he can do. Quote, churches have leadership and members who live in community with each other. Almost all donors come from within that community. Whatever transparency and accountability are necessary will be provided by the rules and structures of the church. The government has no business interfering in a church's internal affairs, end quote. And yes, that is just a long series of non sequiturs followed by not a point, followed by the exclamation of a drunken sovereign citizen at a DUI checkpoint. But it also ignores the fact that 10% of the churches account for 50% of the church attendance because Christians can't even make up bad arguments without lying. But I'll be damned if both of those flimsy ass defenses weren't dutifully parroted in all the mainstream articles that I saw that referenced this piece and talked about this problem. 
right? But the real impetus for all this shows up at the bottom of his speech. And surprise, surprise, it's got nothing to do with his genuine concern for America's philanthropists. It's the fact that a mainstream candidate for president dared to broach the subject of making churches play by the same fucking rules as all the other nonprofits, and that has them terrified. Right. So people like Warren Cole Smith go out and bluster a bit about how very concerned that they are, that people are taking advantage of this otherwise very reasonable tax benefit as a smokescreen whilst never bothering to justify the damn thing in the first place. Look, when Christians come out from any fucking where and fight for this thing, they know good and fucking well that they're primarily fighting for Joel Osteen's mansion, Creflo Dollar's plane and John Gray's wife's car. Right. They're not even fighting to keep money. They get to keep the money either way. They're fighting for the right to lie about that money later. And there is no honest reason to fight for that.